Yeah, good morning. Welcome to my third lecture. Um, the paper that we will discuss today is entitled Value and Momentum Everywhere from Asnes, Moskowitz and Peterson. First of all, I would like to ask if there are any questions concerning yesterday's lecture. Uh, so, as I told you, the, the lectures are building upon each other. So everything that we, that, we, that we discuss in one lecture will be used again in the next lecture and we will basically accumulate our knowledge together. Yeah, that's basically the purpose of a lecture. And uh, yesterday we were discussing principal component analysis very briefly and this concept we will encounter today again. So this paper here that we, that we will discuss today has also some practical relevance and uh, our guest lecturer might give you some today some additional inf information about how the momentum is basically used in the finance industry as well. So who is not familiar with the value effect? I guess everybody of you has heard about the value anomaly, right? That's like bachelor bachelor level, right? And who, is, who of you has heard, heard about momentum earlier? Okay, okay, good, good, good. So what this paper here, the purpose of this paper is basically to figure out or to establish a link between value and momentum. Um, they figure out that value and momentum is negatively correlated. You remember in the first lecture we were talking about the profitability premium and we were discussing that profitability and value are negatively correlated and what impact it has for our portfolio if we would invest in both strategies 50-50. So we said because they are negatively correlated, the overall portfolio risk is decreased, would decrease if we would invest in both strategies 50-50. So and basically something similar is going on here in this paper. Uh, what, what the authors figure out is, or what they basically argue is that value and momentum is also negatively correlated. Yeah. I just, before the lecture started, I made some, some notes here to recall, because we were, just, we were just discussing about it earlier, but just to remind you, you know, we have a portfolio P, where R denotes the overall portfolio return, and we invest A, which is maybe 0.5, and one minus A in asset B. And let's assume also that the expectation of both assets, so the sample average, the expected return is the same. Then we can elaborate, we can compound the, the portfolio variance of RP, which is nothing else but uh, A squared times the variance of the first asset plus the one minus A squared times the variance of the second asset times uh, plus two times A times one minus A times the covariance between those two assets. Yeah. And then I assumed next, let's assume that the variance or the risk of the first and the second assets are the same, it's omega. Then we can simplify this equation and we get this expression here. And if you, and if you calculate it, it's just 0 0.5 times omega times the common variance of these two assets plus the covariance. And this is also 0 0.5 if you, if you calculate it out. So what we see is the first effect, you know, this is what portfolio diversification gives us. So if we invest in, mon in many assets at the same time, the overall portfolio risk is decreasing as N increases. Yeah? You have seen this picture maybe before from, undergraduate, from your undergraduate studies. Uh, if RP is the portfolio risk and N is the assets, the number of assets that you invest in, as N increases, the, the overall portfolio risk decreases. Yeah. So you have seen it earlier in your undergraduate studies. So that's the first effect, you know. You invest in, in, in more than one asset, so the overall risk is lower. But we have the covariance here as well, the second term. 
So if you're very unlucky and the assets are highly correlated, there's no benefit from, from portfolio diversification, right? So it actually increases with the covariance. So, but if the correlation is negative, and if this term here becomes negative, it even decreases the overall portfolio risk more. And that's exactly what's going on here in, in this paper. Since value and, moment, and momentum are negatively correlated, this term here becomes negative, and the overall portfolio risk would be much lower as if you would just invest in one of, this, of, this, of the strategies taken alone. Yeah? So similar things we have discussed in the first lecture when we were discussing about the profitability premium in association with the value premium. Yeah? This is it's clear to everybody. Yeah. So, and what they also figure out First of all, value and momentum are negatively correlated, so you have a benefit if you would invest, if you would run both strategies at the same time, and they also actually um, suggest or propose a 50-50 portfolio, a combined portfolio where you invest 50% in value and 50% in momentum. And if you are familiar with the RAQR funds, they actually run this strategy in real time, so you can actually invest in this investment fund. Yeah, it's, an, it's a real-life investment fund, but in real life, as far as I've understood, they don't invest 50-50, they invest 70% in momentum and 30% in value, as far as I know. So, and they also, what they also do is they make a principal component analysis, so they, come, they consider eight different asset classes, yeah, and they make a principal, com um, principal component analysis and they figure out that, in essence, momentum loads positively on the first principal component and value loads negatively on the first principal component. And then they establish or they argue that the link that both strategies links together is funding liquidity. Yeah. But this paper has also some, I would say, drawbacks and I will come back to that then later. Because, you know, that is, this is here a, um, a university and not an applied science school, I told you earlier. So, I mean, what I want you is also to think critically, you know, not to take everything as it is, but to think about what they have actually done, how they argue, how they motivate, why they draw their conclusions, and to think critically. You know, you have to criticize things. You have to always to question things, you know, not take them as, as they are. So, and that's what also what we will also figure out here, that uh, their story is not maybe 100% um, how we say, button tet, uh, water resistant. So there are some, some things. I actually tried to replicate this paper and I could not come up with the same results. So are there any questions so far? So then let's go through the paper step by step. Yeah. So I already noticed, noted here like the, the key tables in this paper are table one, two, and four. So all the other tables you can more or less neglect, but we will talk about that. So we already talked about that, yeah, that these both strategies are negatively correlated and uh, the core movement suggests that they have one common factor so that, basic, that basically drives both of the strategies. Yeah. Here on the second page um, they argue that you can you know, separate market liquidity from funding liquidity and it's basically the funding liquidity that is the driver here in their, in their study. You know, it's, it's funding liquidity risk that connects these two strategies. Yeah. And they, they also argue here in the second last paragraph on that page, yeah, that's interesting, while liquidity risk may partly expand the positive risk premium associated with momentum because value loads negatively on liquidity risk, the positive premium associated with value becomes an even deeper puzzle. So what does that actually mean? Yeah. What it actually means is that 
as the market becomes less, less liquid, value generates higher returns, uh, which doesn't make much of a sense, right? But that's basically what they, what they argue here. Then also what we were just talking about here on the whiteboard, uh, this negative correlation might, might be of practical relevance for portfolio, for portfolio management since it decreases the overall portfolio risk. So that's the practical implication. So, and here in the end of the page, yeah, they come up with the explanation for why this is so. Yeah. So they argue a simple and natural story might be that momentum represents the most popular trends as investors chase returns and flock to the assets whose prices appreciated most recently. Value, on the other hand, represents a contrarian view. Yeah. So we will discuss that also later during the paper, what's going on here actually, what that means. But that's basically the introduction of that paper. Well, that's, these are the key points of the introduction here in their paper. So to the data, so I told you they were investigating eight different asset classes. So in the section A1, they're describing the data of global individual stocks, what they use. So they use stocks from four equity markets, the US, the UK, continental Europe, and Japan. Yeah, and they also describe that they only use big stocks, which is of course uh, a good thing to do because they are more liquid than small stocks. And moreover, as we discussed yesterday, you know, anomalies tend to be more pronounced among small stocks. So here, if you implement it, if you implement the strategy across, you know, among big stocks, then you can actually even um, run the strategy in, in real time because you have high, you have high liquidity. Uh, every, every strategy that you implement just, that you can just run among small stocks, you can actually not really implement th th that in, in real life, you know, because you most likely cannot even trade them. So section A2, they were describing the, the next asset class, which is global equity indices. What, so what they are using are 18 uh, equity index futures from certain developed equity markets like Australia, Austria, Belgium, Canada, and so on and so forth. Yeah. So it's a very small set, actually, a very small set of assets that they use here, like only 18, 18 different assets. Then they also use currencies, what they describe in section A3, and they use global government bonds. You know, they use 10 different countries, but it's not exactly the same sample that they use. Yeah, if you go through it, you know, it, it's not exactly the same sample what they use for the currencies and for the government bonds. For the currencies, it's actually the, the G10 currencies that they use, and in, in, in many papers, that investigates patterns and currency returns, they use the G10 currencies because they have the highest liquidity. What else do we have? We have commodity futures, so they use 27 different commodity futures. You know, you can go through it if you like. And you know, when I was reading this paper, actually I, I was a little bit wondering how do they motivate the choice? Yeah. So there's, there's no real motivation for why they, for instance, uh, use exactly this, subsamp this set of, of, of uh, commodities. And you know, that, there's always an issue when it comes to, to, to research in general, not only in, in finance, especially also in research in psychology, for instance. You know, what, what people, you might have heard it earlier, what people call sherry picking. Yeah? Sherry picking is when you construct or when you use a data set that basically gives you the results that you want to report. Yeah. But it's not the truth. You know? So this is called cherry picking. And there's a lot of papers going on, in particular in, in, in social science, in certain social science uh, fields, you know, like, like psychology, where people report results, and then the studies are replicated and they find, uh, with a larger sample, and then they find that there are no results. 
Yeah. So if you're interested in this kind of stuff, then I can recommend you the paper from from Amy Cuddy. I mean, I really think she's awesome, and you know, but uh, there's this paper about power pulsing effects published in Psychological Science, which is, which is a top-notch journal, and uh, they, their paper has been replicated a couple of years later, and uh, they couldn't find any, any of those results. So, so that's, so every, always, you know, you have to think about, okay, what's actually going on here in the paper? Why do they choose this sample? You know, what, what's the motivation? And so on and so forth. So you always, you have to think critically. Yeah? That's, that's important. Also, when you write your master thesis, you know, I will, I will also ask you, I, I will ask you for why you do what you do and why you use this sample. At this time period, so. so you have always to argue for for why you do what you do, so that people can check. Okay, is this, is this really really reasonable what you do? Yeah. So next, and now it becomes interesting. I will take this away now. So we need the space. So now, this section, section B, they are talking about how they measure uh, the value and momentum effect, or how they construct the underlying portfolios. Yeah? So for, for stocks, it's pretty much straight, straightforward how they construct the uh, value portfolios. Yeah? It's, it's, it's the same thing, like basically the same, the same setup like in Parliament French. Yeah? They use lagged six months uh, book values in order to ensure that it is public available in, in information and then divided by the, by the market value at time t. That's, and that's the actual stochastic part here in this uh, equation. Yeah. And then they sort basically all the stocks from low to high book to market ratio. Yeah. So that's, that's straightforward. That's, that's nothing new. And for momentum, it's, it's uh, also the traditional approach, what they do here, that's, that's nothing new, basically. They, if we have a timeline, T, and we, have, we are at T0 here, here's T, T1, and here we have T minus 1, T minus 2, and so on. And let's say here's T minus 12, well, they accumulate the returns if we are t0, so they accumulate the returns from t minus 2 until t minus 12. Yeah? So they take the sum from t minus 2 until t minus 12 over rit, which are the excess returns of SLI at time t. So, and they do this for all N assets in the portfolio, yeah. And then they are short in those stocks that have the lowest cumulative return in this time period. And they buy those stocks, the winner stocks, that have the highest return or the highest cumulative return in this sample period from T minus 2 until T minus 12. And then they, they keep those stocks in, in the portfolio constant for the forecast horizon, which is t plus 1. And then they move on. They do the same thing again. If they are then here, then t in the next period, this becomes t0. And they move this time window one month ahead and do the same thing again. And so this strategy is rebalanced at the beginning of each month. But it's, it's the same strategy for all the assets that they consider. So they, they do the same for currencies, the same for commodities, same for bonds, and so on and so forth. That's how they compound the momentum strategy. Yeah, 
This is what they describe here in the end of the page. Any questions? So if you read the literature, you know, there, you will find different types of setups, how you basically compound the cumulative return that you use for sorting the assets. So in my MATLAB course, we will discuss different strategies uh, because there are different momentum strategies. And um, some of them are maybe more profitable than others, but that's basically the standard strategy yeah, that, 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 that is discussed in many different papers as well. So, but it becomes a little bit more tricky with the book to market ratio, right? Because for stocks it's obvious. So we just have to look into the account statement from, from last year or so, you know, and then we know the book value of each company. So that's, that's, that's no big deal. But the, but the problem is, you know, for instance, currencies, they don't have a book value, right? So, or commodities don't have a book value either. You know, what's the book value of, 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 of iron, you know? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? So, but what they do instead is something else. Now I have to check my, my own notes. Yeah. Again, we have a timeline here. And here's the price of the commodity or the currency. Now we are talking in years. So T minus five is year minus five. So it's 60 months ago. And here is T0. This is wh where we are now. Let me just make it more clearer right here. Yeah. So, and then let's plot the time series evolution of our asset. So then we can get the price. This is the price for T is minus five. And let's say this is 50. Uh, let's say this is 50. And we can get the price from today. This is the price for T is zero. And that's, let's say, 20. So the difference in price is minus 30, right? Minus 30 divided by the initial price, is, which is 50, which this is minus 60%. And then they write, they take the negative. The negative of minus 60 is, of course, 60. So then they, they do the same thing for all their assets, you know, they, you might remember, they use 10 currencies, so they do this 10 times for the currencies, 27 times for the commodities, and then they sort these in an increasing order from low value to high. Yeah. So then they, they sell those that have a low value here, and they buy those assets. That have a high value here. So that's actually how they do. So they, they, they take the negative of the minus five year return, basically. That's basically what, what they do. Because they are somehow proxy this here as the, as the book value, you know. So in this case here, this asset would probably end up in the buy portfolio because it has a pretty high value. 
And uh, because they, they say, they argue it's a contrarian strategy, so assets that have decreased a lot within the last five years, they are expected to move, move back to their actual value. Okay? That's basically the, the idea behind value strategies. And if you have another asset that maybe has this time series evolution here, and we are at time zero, then we'd probably, this asset would probably end up in the sell portfolio, right, in the, in, the, in the sell side, because we would expect, okay, it has increased so much over the last five years, now it's time to go to, go to the actual mean again, okay? So that's, that's the idea of the contrarian strategy or of the value strategy, yeah? And this asset here is expected to go in this direction, yeah? So that's what they do, basically. That's the idea behind it. Any questions? So that's basically what is reported here on page 936, 37, and so on. And then I made this, this picture here, you know, just in order to, you will probably not find this in the literature or in, in, in any book or so, you know. I just came up with that when I read, read the paper. So we have, I call it the, the return cycle. Yeah. We have an asset over time. Uh, so the correlation with the expected return, one, one period ahead, should be negative if we take the five years, the five years uh, cumulative return. It should be positive for the 12 months cumulative return using the past 12 months and it would be negative for the past month's return. So these are the three effects, the book to market or the value effect uh, for the past five years. Then we have the momentum effect, this is, which is concerned um, about the return evolution of the past 12 months, which is a shorter effect. And then we have we talked about the so-called short-term reversal effect where you know, the winners of, of, of last month tend to underperform those stocks that have per performed very poorly in, in the last month, which is called the, or, or which is referred to the short-term reversal effect, yeah? reported or documented first in the 1990 paper from Igatesh. So it's, and I call this the return cycle. Yeah? So there is some autocorrelation going on in assets. That's the idea, or that's, that's basically my, my point. And these patterns you find, as I told you, in, uh, across assets. It's not spe specific to stocks only. So they have 48 test assets. Yeah. So they have three portfolios, they are sorting the assets each, in each asset class, they sort the asset into terciles, like low, medium, and high. They have two strategies and eight asset classes. So three times two times eight is 48. So 48 test assets in their portfolio. So section D, we can skip. You know, it doesn't, it's not interesting. And the first interesting table is table one. Yeah. Table one. So in table one, they report the correlation. Yeah, if we, in panel A, individual stock portfolios. Uh, sorry, no. Table A, they, what they report here, this, I was already on table two in my thoughts. But no, in table one, they report the, the average return. Uh, and we see here on the left-hand side of panel A, they report the average returns of these three portfolio groups. Like, for the first portfolio has the um, growth stocks, and P3 has the value stocks. Yeah, and then they report here the spread if, where they go long on portfolio three and short on, on, on portfolio one. The spread is 3.7 using U.S. stocks and the sample from 72 to 2011, 3.7% per year is annualized returns with a T-statistic of 1.83. What does it tell you? Are value strategies 
and the sample period in the US profitable. What do you think? Has anyone an idea? Or do I have to plot again the normal distribution? So what's the critical value on the right hand side of the, of the normal distribution? Yeah. So is 3.7% per year statistically significant or not? So under the null hypothesis, the payoff is zero, but if the t-statistic is larger than 1.96, it indicates that the point estimate is statistically different from zero on the 5% level. Because 5% of the probability mass, 2.5% is here on the right tail, and 2.5% is below minus 1.96. So if we have a significant level of 5%, and if, it, and if the null hypothesis is true, in repeated sampling, the point estimate should be somewhere here in, in this area. Yeah? So 3.7 falls here. It's, it's still within the, within the distribution, within the critical values. So if the null hypothesis is true, or it, it seems to be true here in, in this case. So st st statistically, the 3.7 is not different from zero on a 5% level. So there's no value premium in the US in the sample period, statistically. This is what it means. But if it becomes different after risk adjustment, so after risk adjustment, the payoff is slightly higher. And you know what risk adjustment means. So we were talking about it yesterday. So if you regress it on the risk factor, on the asset pricing model, so the alpha is then the risk adjusted return. And after risk adjustment, the annualized return is 5.3% with a t-statistic of 2.66. And now we can say that the risk adjusted return indeed is statistically significant on a 5% level, even on a 1% level actually, um, in the US during this assembly period. Yeah. On the right hand side from panel A, we see the same for momentum portfolios. Again, they use ter tercels, so three groups, from lowest performing stocks, which you find in portfolio one, P1, to, highest performance, uh, to, to the highest performing stocks, which are in P3, and then you find the zero cost strategy, which is here, P3 minus P1, with average pay of 5.4% of per year, and the tier statistic of 2.8. So which means 2.08, it's larger than 1.96. So this payoff here is statistically significant on a 5% level during this assembly period. So that's the raw payoff, yeah? This is also, this was the raw payoff. So after risk adjustment, so after you regress this payoff series on the asset pricing model, it becomes even larger, it's 8.7% per year, with a tier statistic of 3.22, highly significant highly significant. Here on the right hand side of the table, of table one, panel A, you find this 50-50 portfolio, this, com this combined portfolio that I was talking about in the beginning of the lecture. So they invest 50% in momentum and 50% in value. And of course the average payoff must be the, the average of this and this. So if you invest 50% here and 50% here, it should be e exactly the average, right? So the, the raw payoff is 4.6 with an amazing t-statistic of 3.98. So highly significant on any level. So why is the t-statistic so high? Why is this higher than 2.84 and 1.83? Now we have to remember 
what I was plotting here in the beginning of the lecture. Okay? We had the covariance term. This is our portfolio here, consisting of two, two different strategies. And the covariance is negative. So a t-statistic, how, how is a t-statistic defined? You have the point estimate of the, of the parameter divided by the summer deviation, right? But this is a combined portfolio. And because the covariance is negative, the overall portfolio risk is much lower than from the momentum strategy alone or from the value strategy alone. That's why the t-statistic is so high. Yeah. Then we have here the risk adjusted return and it's just increasing here 5.7% per year with a t statistic of 5.5. Uh, and the average correlation between stock momentum and stock value strategies in the US given this sample period here is minus 0.53. A similar like uh, the negative correlation between profitability and value that we have been discussing a couple of days ago. So if you, if you consider the other tables um, or the, the, the other panels of table I, uh, they, uh, of, of the table one, they are quite similar results. So that's why I just, I just go through panel A here. You can go through the other uh, panels at home, but uh, they report basic data, they basically con confirm what is reported in, in panel A. In table two, which is now the next important table, and maybe the most interesting table here, they report the correlations of the average return series. Yeah. For instance, in panel A of table two, they report an average correlation between stock value and stock value, also between, like, if they implement the value strategies uh, between the European market, uh, the US market, Asian market, and so on and so forth the average correlation of these value strategies is 0.68 across these stock markets. And this star here indicates that this correlation is significant on a 5% level here. Yeah. Then we have the correlation between stock value and non-stock value. So now they compound the average correlation. They use these uh, different um, equity markets and uh, they um, and the uh, value strategy implemented in commodities and currencies and, and, and equity futures and so on. So this correlation is 0.15. It's much lower actually co compared to stock value and, and stock value, but it's highly significant on a on a on a five percent level. And what you also see on the left hand side of panel A. All these correlations are positive, and two of three are significantly positive. <coughs> if we now move to the right-hand side of panel A, they report stock momentum, the, the, the correlation between uh, stock value and stock momentum, which you see here, correlation between stock value and stock momentum is minus 0.53. This is also the, the number that we just saw in the other table, right? in the footnote, minus 0.53. So, and the correlation between stock momentum and stock value is also significant. It's significantly negative on the 5% level. Then next we see the correlation between stock value and non-stock momentum. And these are, these are first of all completely different strategies and second of all com completely different asset markets. Yeah? But the correlation is significantly negative on a 5% level. And you can go through all the others here as well. So what you see here is a cluster. So the correlation between value, 
strategies and momentum strategies across asset markets is negative. And it's even significantly negative on the 5% level for all of these components. That's a cluster. Yeah. And what you see here, the collection matrix, is actually a block matrix. Yeah. On the left-hand side, we have positive correlations. Then this sub-matrix here on the right-hand side, where, where um, value and momentum strategies are reported, it's negative. And if we move down now, on the lower part here of the panel, they report stock momentum. Uh, for instance, here, stock momentum and non-stock momentum, the correlation is positive. But non-stock momentum, which is like commodities and currencies, have actually nothing to do with, with stocks. It's a different asset class. But anyways, the correlation is significant on a 5% on a level. And that's the important thing here, to recognize that here's a clustering going on. Those correlations here are significantly positive. They are negative, and they are positive here again. And that's actually the key point in their paper. All these in table two. Are there any questions, or is it obvious? I think that's pretty obvious, right? So, <laughs> you know, I I also said in the in the beginning already that they do a principal component analysis because this table here that we just saw. It, it, it gives you a cluster, and this cluster basically suggests that there might be a common factor that drives some of the strategies into the opposite direction as the others. So what they do is, so they compound the first principal component. They, they use all of these, these strategies, yeah, as we showed yesterday, and they compound the first principal component. And they report it here on, on, on figure, what is it, figure two? No, it's, it's figure one. So that's basically what comes out. For me, it's a, it's a little bit fuzzy what's going on here. But they argue that the first principle component expands like uh, almost 0.4 of US, of US uh, stocks and op almost 0.44 for, for UK stocks, and it loads positively, and whereas it loads negatively for value strategies. So what they actually are doing here, so we were yesterday, we were yesterday talking about that. Yeah. I, I showed you this, this, this time series. So if you imagine this, this, this X series there, we have 48 different, different strategies, like, like in their paper, so there are 48 different series here. And then they run this, this, this PCA, so they break it down. Then they use the first, the highest eigenvalue and the, the um, associated eigenvector with this, with this largest eigenvalue and compound this S1 series here. Yeah? Exactly like, like we did yesterday. Yeah? So, and then they regress. You, know, you can neglect this, these terms here yeah? because they don't use the first, uh, the second, and the third one. They only use the first one here, and they regress it on this on these strategies here. And then they check the loading, this beta loading here, against this time series, this mechanically constructed time series of, of, of the first principal component. Yeah? So and then they figure out well, it loads positively on momentum. And explains like I don't know 0.4 of the variation, like 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 40 percent of the overall variation, and it loads negatively on the value strategies. That's basically what they did, yeah. But it's it isn't that obvious from from the table, right? But that's basically what they did, and that's what is what is reported here. So, 
so. Then on table three, that's the next interesting table, they regress the value and momentum strategies on macroeconomic factors. Yeah. They do it for US stocks, they do it for the global stocks, for non-stock assets, and then for, for all asset classes. So, and here, on the, as regressors, they use what you see here, long-run consumption growth, they have a recession dummy, they, they use GDP growth, they use the market factor, they use the term spread, and so on and so forth. And then they report the R squared, the point estimates and the T-statistics here. So if you go through it, most of the T-statistics are smaller than 1.96, but larger than minus 1.96. So the most of the T-statistics indicate that these models here actually do not explain anything of the variation of the value strategy or the momentum strategy. So macroeconomic variables are poor in explaining the spread of value or momentum strategies. Uh, and the R square is, is very little, as you see here. The, the maximum you see here for, for value strategies is 13.1%, but here you see 2.3%, 6.4%, 3.4%. It's, it's not much. So macroeconomic variables or, or macro risk is not able to explain momentum strategies or value strategies irrespective of what asset class we actually consider. And uh, it's often, you know, often you are, if you do research, then you are supposed to report these kind of tables here. And I, well, I mean, for me, it should be nowadays common knowledge that, that this is like that, you know, but still people ask you to do the same regressions over and over again, even though people should already know it, you know, I mean, if, if, if the, it has been done thousands of times and in none of these papers, any macro factor has explained any, any cross-sectional asset pricing anomaly, but people still require this kind of stuff, you know, even though they know the, the outcome is zero. But, you know, sometimes you have to do these things even though you know that it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Yeah, and if you if you hear the um, if you read about liquidity in a in a, in a finance paper or in a, in a finance context, when 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 I read it or when I hear it, I'm thinking about bid ask spread or you know turn turnover or something, but not in this paper. So I was supposed to go to Google myself here. So what what do they actually mean here? So funding funding liquidity. And this is actually reported here in section B1, measuring funding and market liquidity risk. So, and they argue here, the funding liquidity variables are the treasury euro dollar, like the TED spread, the average over the, the, average over the month of the daily local three-month internet, LIBOR interest rate minus the local three-month government rate. Yeah. So, and if you download the data, if you have a look on the data, I will take this away here now. I actually did it once. I actually downloaded the TED, TED spread data. TED. Teddy. Actually, TED, TEDx talk, you know, I mean, it, it, it's like uh, if you use YouTube sometimes, you know, there's this TEDx, TEDx talk, which is actually quite interesting. They, re, they, re, they report pretty interesting stuff. You might learn something useful there. So the TED spread is a little bit like this, moving up and down. And what they do is basically, let's define R. R is the TED spread at time T. 
And what they do is they regress it on an intercept plus itself minus 1, so the lect tet variable plus on the second leg of itself. And you have an error term, yeah, like in any other regression model as well. So because this process here is autocorrelated, you know, as you already see if from, from visual inspection, so the observation from one period, if the observation of, um, of, of one period is, is likely to be, um, so if the, if the observation of the previous period is high, it's likely that the observation in, in, in the next period is high as well. And this is sort of autocorrelation. And that is basically, you can model that. And you can get rid of the autocorrelation if you regress it on two legs of itself. So what comes out here, the error term is a stationary process. The, the error term, if you run this model here, so there's some systematic inf 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 information going on. And you basically, you get the unsystematic part here, the error term, which is the error term, after the regression. If this is the corresponding error term of the regression model. And of course, you know, if you, if you run an, an OLS regression and you include an intercept term, the regression residuals always sum up to zero. Yeah, and what you get is a process that is, which is a white noise process, yeah, which is about zero, and every element here is an innovation, yeah, and they interpret it as shock. So that's basically what they use as liquidity shocks, yeah, and they use different measures. The TED, they, they, the, the TED spread is only one of the measures. They use. Uh, different of, of these measures and do the same thing. So they run an R2 model, which is this model here, and they take the residuals, which basically capture the unsystematic part here, the, the shocks in the system. Yeah. So in this table here, this is, this is table four. It's also a, in a, in an important table here. They report for the US the liquidity measures. We have a pointer here. So they have the TED, they have the, they have the TED spread. They use the LIBOR term repo, and they have the swap table here. These are three different measures for finding liquidity risk in their paper. Yeah? And they regress those, those innovations here. So they, they use these guys here the innovations, and use it and regress them on the value and on the momentum strategy, as well as on the combination strategy. And the point estimates you see here. Yeah? For instance, value is negatively correlated with this innovation part here, or with the, or with the liquidity shocks of the TED spread. The point estimate is minus 0, 0, 0, 0.0052, and the statistic is minus 1.44. So for the TEDx spread, it, or for the TED spread, it's actually not significant on a 5% level, yeah, because it's, it's somewhere here. But for the LIBOR term repo, if you take the innovations from that time series here, we see the correlation is statistically significantly negative on the 5% level. Whereas momentum loads positively on the LIBOR term repo innovations, or, or liquidity shocks, but it's not significant because the statistic is 1.11. Whereas for the TED spread, it's significant for momentum. So, and now what they do is here in the last row, they report the funding liquidity PC, which is the principal component. So they take the three time series here and they did exactly what we did yesterday. Yeah. Let's go back here. They do this, this stuff here. Yeah. They have three time series. They do the PCA. And again, mostly, we are only interested in the, in the, in the, in the most dominant factor, yeah. in, the, in the 
highest in the uh, eigenvector that is associated with the highest or largest eigenvalue, which is the first principal component. So we are only interested in S1 here. We do not consider S2 and S3, only S1. And that's basically the, the driver of all of these three liquidity shock measures. Yeah? And that's what they report here. So they, they extract the first principal component time series yeah, that basically links all of these three time series together. And they, again, use the innovations here and regress, it, and regress them on the, on the value spread and the momentum spread. And what you see here is that the value uh, spread is significantly negatively correlated with the principal component of these three funding liquidity measures. The T-statistic is minus 2.89. Whereas momentum loads positively on the first principal component of these three liquidity measures with a T-statistic of 3.31. Uh -huh. So another thing or, or another thought of how you can think about principal component analysis is that you that you try to get rid of the noise. Yeah. Because uh, it somehow gives you the, the main driver, uh, the, 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 the core driver of these time series that you consider in the systems of equations. Yeah. So we can say, maybe we can say that, the, that these three measures here are a proxy for the same underlying risk. And what PCA is doing, it gets rid of the information that is not necessary and grabs just the information where all of these measures here co-move, that all of these measures have in common. Uh, so they did it for funding liquidity and they do the same thing again using three different measures of market liquidity, which you see here. And they do the same regressions on value and on momentum. And you see most of them here, most of the point estimates are significantly, uh, are not different from zeros in a statistical sense. And again, they use the principal component here of these three, market, uh, of these three measures for market, li market liquidity risk. And they find that value and momentum do not load statistically significantly on this uh, on the, on the first principal component of these three measures here. So, and they conclude that it's obviously funding liquidity risk that is linked to value and to momentum and not market liquidity risk. Yeah. This is clear to everybody. Yeah. So they do the same thing again, but then they use not US liquidity measures, but in this table here, in table four, panel B, they use global liquidity risk measures. Uh, and they have data now for the global test spread and global LIBOR and so on and so forth. So they do the same thing again, and it's the same outcome. Yeah? It's obviously funding liquidity that is related or that drives the value and momentum, or that, yeah, that, that it's associated with value and momentum payoffs but it's not market liquidity. So I think I asked that also in an, in an exam at some point. You know, that's the easy point here, I think. And uh, it's obvious and uh, it's, it's, it's the main, it captures the main, well, the, the main message of the, of the paper basically. Here they plot basically uh, how, how the innovation part of the liquidity measures looks like. Yeah? It's actually what I made here on the whiteboard. So, yeah. So before we move on to the asset pricing model that they propose here in, in their paper, uh, my concern 
with this paper is, uh, or one of, one of my concerns for this paper is um, they distinguish somehow, so they make two different analyses here. This is how it seems to me, how it appears to me. So first of all, they use all these 48 uh, assets and they make a principal component analysis using this, this 40, 48 assets and then they argue, okay, the first principal component is uh, positively associated with, values, uh, with momentum strategies, but it is negatively associated with value strategies. So far, so good. Fair enough. But then they do a different analysis and they talk about funding liquidity and they, reg and they regress different funding li li liquidity measures and market liquidity measures on the value and on the momentum strategies. But for me, it isn't obvious that the first principal component of these 48 different strategies is actually correlated with market liquidity or funding liquidity. I, I, I couldn't see any table or any uh, hint here that actually mm, the first principal component of this value and momentum strategies is actually has something to do with the funding liquidity, what they argue here in the paper. For me, it isn't obvious, and I haven't found any table in, the, in this paper that basically regresses the, this innovation part of the TET spread, for instance, on the first principal component series of these 48 strategies. This is what I would, what I would have asked them to do, or what I would, would have liked to see in this paper. Then it would be a strong case, you know, but for me, this is a little bit like fuzzy. I don't know how it feels for you, but for me it feels a little bit fuzzy, what's going on here. Oh, and table in section four now, they basically, they, su they suggest a new asset pricing model uh, where they use uh, this, this 48 uh, test as this 48 strategies uh, as test assets on the left hand side and here what you can see here as regressors they, they have basically what they use is for, for each strategy they have the market factor which is like the global the global equity factor for instance and they use all of the other strategies here but not the one that they use as a test asset here on the left hand side. So they exclude what they have on the left hand side here when they compound the overall value factor that they use as uh, one of the risk factors here in the model. And they do the same for the momentum factor here, for the global momentum factor. So they use all these other strategies but not the strategy that they use here on the left hand side, which also makes sense actually from my point of view, you know. That makes, that makes sense. So they run this model and that's the fit basically. This is all this 48 test assets you see here and uh, if the model fit would be perfect then all of them would, would be on this, on this line. So the R square is 0.55 which is not bad. Yeah, but it's not perfect either, of course. So, and this is not an asset pricing test, as they argue in their paper. And an asset pricing test is also not possible here, since we have different regressors here for each of the models. Yeah, that's the problem here. Because they use, they, they always exclude, when they calculate the, the value factor or the, or the momentum factor, they exclude the corresponding portfolio that is here on the left-hand side. So and therefore, for each of these test assets, they have different, slightly different risk factors here. And that's why they cannot make a, a formal test of the, of the intercept here. You know, how the GRS test is set up, I will discuss most likely in the last lecture. So I have, I made already, I uploaded already on Moodle um, this, this handout you know, but, but we will discuss it in detail in, in the last lecture. And then, of course, in the exercise sessions, we will go through an empirical example how you would actually implement it in, in, in eViews.
Mm. Next, they propose this model here where they now include like all of the portfolios here. So now we can actually run an asset pricing test here because here they have uh, uh, the portfolio that is here on the left hand side is also a part of this factor here on the right hand side. Yeah. And on and, and this figure here is it figure figure six. Yeah. Figure six is also important. So they basically compare their own asset pricing model consisting of these three factors, yeah, the, the global value factor, the global momentum factor, and the market factor, and they com compare this, this asset pricing model with the cap M, with the global cap M, including just the market factor. Then they have here, they use also the Farmer and French four factor model as another benchmark model. and the Farmer and French six six factor model. Yeah. So and what what comes out here or the the, the main point here in in these figures is that uh, the R square is highest for their three factor model. It's basically 0.71 so 71 percent of the variation of the cross sectional variation is explained by their three factor model. Whereas, for instance, the Farmer and Friends four factor model explains only 55%, or the Farmer and Friends six factor model explains only 60%. The Cap M is the poorest model here, it explains only 45%. Then they report also the GRS test statistic. And uh, this is basically, I told you already in the in introduction lecture, it's in essence the average of this uh, intercept across these test assets. You know, you have, it's a multivariate model and if you have 48 test assets, you would have basically the, the, the average across these 48 intercepts here, which is basically in essence your test statistic. It's something like that, but we will go through it in, in more detail soon. But uh, the, the main point here is that the GRS test is, is the lowest for their three-factor model. Yeah? It's much higher for all the other models here. And the lower the test statistic, the better. But still, the, the p-value indicates that none of these models here prices the set of test assets correctly. Yeah? So because under the null hypothesis, if we run the GRS test, under the null hypothesis, the pricing errors, the intercepts are on average zero. And if the p-value is smaller than 5%, we reject the null hypothesis because they, they, they fall into the critical area here. So in all of these models here, we reject the null hypothesis that the pricing errors are zero, which, which means statistically none of these models here can actually price our test assets, this 48, you know, test portfolios correctly. But at least what we can see is that this three-factor model that, 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 that they describe or that they suggest here in, in the paper does at least a quite all right job in describing the cross-sectional evolutions of returns. So I guess that's, that are the key points here of, of the paper. Now you have some time to, to think about it or to ask some questions if you like. Or is everything crystal clear? Who knows? Otherwise, we have at uh, two o'clock, no wait. No, it's actually in about 45 minutes. The guest lecturer is coming and it's in Kurten, in the other lecture room, okay? Kurten, 203.